somebody, please. Yeah, there's somebody after me. I'm sorry? There's somebody after me. Where are you? There's somebody after me. What's the matter? Are you okay? What are you going to do? What are you going to do to me? Please, stop. No, stop it, please. Hey everyone, welcome back to my channel. I hope you're all doing super, super well. Today, we're gonna be talking about a case that I'm sure many of you are very familiar with, but has also been very highly requested. Back in 2020, I watched this movie with my mom called Lost Girls. It stars Amy Ryan, who played Holly in The Office, and the movie was just absolutely heartbreaking, but also very eye-opening. The movie is about a mother who is determined to find their missing daughter, and her determination to solve the case actually leads police to the discovery of a handful of unsolved murders of sex workers. No one wanted to take these deaths seriously because they're sex workers and they did it to themselves by being involved in that business, which is horrible. I don't get how people have that mentality. Anyways, the movie is really good. I highly recommend that you guys watch it. But my point with mentioning the movie is that it was inspired by the true case of Liz, aka the Long Island serial killer. The victims of this evil man are mostly sex workers. And although it is relevant to the case that they did this as a job, these people were more more than just escorts and prostitutes or hookers, which is how they're mostly portrayed by the media. They were real people whose essence shouldn't be forgotten or overshadowed by their line of work. These victims were mothers, daughters, sisters, cousins, and friends to many. They had a whole life that they had lived before their death and they were deprived of their life that they had ahead of them. While researching this case, I really try to find out more about who these people were in their everyday lives, what their upbringing was like, what did they enjoy, what dreams and goals did they have, for themselves and just who they were as a person and I really hope you guys are as touched by them as much as I was. There has been numerous books, movies, articles, podcasts, TV shows, and just so much speculation about who this serial killer is. It honestly seemed like this case was gonna go cold and remain a mystery forever. However, with advancements in DNA technology and a new task force created to find the killer, there has finally been an arrest. This case is currently ongoing but this is information that we have as of now. Since since there is just so much information to go over, I will be making two parts for this video. Part two will be up next week. In part one today, we're going to be talking about how the Gilgo Beach victims were discovered, what happened before they disappeared, who they were, how the investigation began, and why it took more than 13 years for there to be an arrest. All the information gathered for this video is public information. We went through so many documentaries. We watched so many interviews with family members, with friends, with detectives. We went through court documents documents. So all of my sources will be linked in the description box down below if you guys want to look more into it. This case can be very confusing. So I just wanted to compile all of this information together and explain it to you guys in the easiest and you know, most clear way possible. There is just so much information to go over. So let's get right into it. To fully understand what led up to the arrest, we need to start at the very beginning. This takes us back to the evening of April 30th, 2010 in Jersey City, New Jersey. 23 year old Shannon Marie Gilbert and her boyfriend Alex Diaz are hanging out and decide to go to the movies together. So they go get some Taco Bell, they sneak their food into the movie theater, and they end up watching the remake of A Nightmare on Elm Street. The movie ends and they go their separate ways towards the end of the night. Later that night, Shannon tells Alex that she's actually going to go to work that night. Well, Shannon was working as an escort at the time and had actually posted an ad on Craigslist that night. So just in case you guys aren't familiar with Craigslist, I'm not even sure if it's still like around today. I don't really hear people talking about it but it's basically I guess you could call it like not eBay but it's basically like a platform where you can like sell stuff but you can also look for like roommates or like you know it's just like a place where you can basically put up advertisements so Shannon would use Craigslist to get her clients so she starts getting ready she puts on blue jeans a black top a brown jacket and sandals she ends up getting a message from a client who responded to the ad that she had posted on Craigslist and she was off now Shannon lived in Jersey City New Jersey and this client's home was around an hour away from her in Oak Beach, New York. Even though it was far and it was pretty late at night, Shannon decided to accept the client because she really needed the money. And since it was so late, she figured that there wouldn't really be any traffic to get to Oak Beach. Now this client was offering her 
$50 for just two hours of her time. So Shannon calls her driver, Michael Pack, and tells him that she's going to accept this client, and then the two of them head over to Oak Beach shortly before midnight on May 1st. Now, apart from Michael being Shannon's driver, he also served as protection, and he would actually wait for her until she was done with her clients, and because of that, he would then also take a cut of the money that she made. I can imagine it's probably really scary to go into a stranger's house, so it's good that Shannon did have this protection and this driver. So the two of them arrive at this client's home, which was in a gated community at around 2 o'clock in the morning. Shannon walks inside the house, meets her client, which was 46-year-old Joseph Brewer, and then Michael waits outside for her in the car. He reclines his seat, you know, he's just like relaxing, he's playing poker on his phone, and he's basically just hanging out waiting for Shannon to finish. Not too long into the visit, Shannon calls Michael and asks him to go buy her some playing cards, lube, and massage oil, to which Michael said no because according to him, the last time that he went to go buy her something that late, the store was closed and it was kind of like a wasted trip. And on top of that, this neighborhood in Oak Beach was pretty isolated from stores, so he just didn't really want to like go look for a store this late at night to see if he could possibly buy her the supplies. So he tells her no, and he says that Shannon got kind of annoyed at his response and was just like, okay, whatever, I'll find my own way home. And then she just hung up the phone, which according to Michael, he feels like she just said that to kind of like guilt trip him into going to the store for her. He tried calling her back a few times, and when she finally picked up, she just told him, no, it's okay, you don't have to get it. So Michael was like, okay, cool, and he just kept waiting in the car until Shannon was done with her client. While waiting, Michael notices that Shannon and the client Joseph actually leave his house, and they go drive somewhere, but then return shortly after. It's not really clear where they went to or how long they were gone for. There is some speculation that maybe they just decided to go get the supplies themselves. Maybe they went to a CVS that was open 24 hours and bought that stuff, but this has not been confirmed. So they go do this little quick trip and then come back to the house. Then at around four o'clock in the morning, Shannon calls Michael and tells him she'll be extending the visit another hour, to which Michael was fine with because then that meant that there was more money for him. So he agreed. Other than that, everything was pretty much going as usual. However, shortly after that phone call, the client, Joseph, actually goes outside and begins tapping on Michael's car window and tells him to take Shannon home because she is acting erratically and says that she began to panic out of nowhere and that he wanted her to leave his home, but that she was refusing to do so. Now, Michael is sitting in the car and he is so confused by this. He's just like, wait, what is going on? Like this night was perfectly peaceful and now you're telling me that Shannon is freaking out? So he decides to get out of the car and he goes inside the client's home to talk to Shannon. He says that she was sitting in Joseph's living room, refusing to move and just crouching behind a couch, moving weirdly and kind of speaking in like hushed tones and just acting very strange and clutching her cell phone. During this time, Shannon actually had called 911 at around 4.51 in the morning and her 911 call is public. I'm not sure if the entire thing is because she was on the phone with 911 for about 23 minutes, but you can hear like little parts of the 911 call, which is just very, very eerie. So of course, since 911 calls are recorded, police know exactly what Shannon was saying. And we also know what Michael and Joseph were saying because you could hear them in the background trying to calm Shannon down. The 911 operator picks up the phone and Shannon repeatedly says, quote, there's somebody after me, there's somebody after me. And Michael was in the background trying to tell her, hey, it's me, come on, what are you doing? And then you can also hear Joseph saying, I'm out, I'm going upstairs, get her out of here. Shannon is just not listening to Michael or to Joseph. And when the operator tries asking her multiple times where she is, Shannon just ignores the operator and continues to say, there's somebody after me, they're trying to kill me. At one point, you can hear Shannon even say, quote, no, stop, what are you going to do? Are you going to kill me? State police. Yeah, there's somebody after me. I'm sorry? There's somebody after me. Where are you? There's somebody after me. Oh, are you, what's the matter? Are you okay? What are you going to do? What are you going to do to me? Please, stop. Please, Mike. 
Yeah. As I said, the 911 call is just absolutely chilling. And in the background, you can just still hear Michael trying to talk to her and calm her down. But anytime Michael would get close to her, she would just tell him to not get near her and to get away. In the call, some people feel like Shannon sounds kind of disoriented and just not very rational. She sounds very panicked and just absolutely frightened. With the 911 operator still on the call, Shannon dashes out of Joseph's home and she actually stumbles down the front doorsteps and run towards the home of an elderly neighbor named Gus. Now, Gus says that it was around five o'clock in the morning and he was already awake at this point. He was actually in his bathroom shaving and just like getting ready for the day when all of a sudden he just heard this loud banging on his front door. This of course startled him. I mean, just imagine being awake at five o'clock in the morning shaving and just getting ready for your day and then just hearing someone pounding on your door. It is absolutely frightening and I of course don't blame anybody for not answering the door because I mean, I don't know if I would have. So Gus hears this, he's a little bit nervous, but he decides to open the door and he says that Shannon was just standing there staring at him. All of a sudden I heard somebody screaming and banging on my door. She says, help me, help me. And I asked her what was the matter and she didn't answer me. She just stood there staring at me. And kept saying, help me, help me, help me. And of course, Gus is so confused and just honestly scared. And he tells her, are you okay? What is going on? Don't get yourself hurt. So while Shannon is just there, Gus also ends up calling 911 and tells Shannon to wait inside his home while police arrive. But he says that Shannon just ran away after he told her that the police were on their way. As he was watching Shannon run away, he sees that she starts to hide behind his boat that he had parked at his house for a quick second before running back off and then Gus says that he noticed an Asian man in a black SUV going and stopping the car which as we know was Michael her driver because Michael at this point is trying to get Shannon to calm down and he's like chasing her all over this neighborhood so Gus sees Michael chasing after Shannon and tells him that he already called the police and that's when Michael tells him that that wasn't necessary and that they would be leaving and he goes to continue to follow Shannon he says oh we're having a party down there and the girl got upset and left I'm looking for the girl. Then she bolted from under the boat and ran around the gate house and he took off after her. Police received another phone call at around 521 in the morning from another neighbor. This neighbor was named Barbara and she reported Shannon was banging on her door saying that she was in danger. But Barbara said that she wasn't going to open the door because she didn't know this woman and she was scared. Which like I said, I feel like people kind of judge Barbara for not doing this but I'm just trying to picture myself like at 5 o'clock in the morning someone banging on my door. I just really don't know if I would answer. So instead she just calls 911 and is like, hello, there's this woman knocking on my door saying she needs help. So police take down her information and after hanging up the phone with 911, Barbara calls one of her other neighbors named Tom and she tells him, you know, hey, can you come help me? Like there's this girl at my door asking for help. I don't really know what's going on. So Tom's like, okay, yes, let me check it out. And he goes outside of his home, looks around, but sees no one. Going back to my Michael, Michael was still looking for Shannon, but eventually he just ended up losing track of her and he actually decided to just leave the neighborhood because it was, you know, early in the morning, people were getting ready for work and, you know, Shannon and Michael were doing something illegal. So he didn't really want the police to show up and see what they were doing. So he says that he honestly just figured that Shannon would find her own way back home. Then, finally, at around 5.40 in the morning, nearly an hour after Shannon first called 911, police finally showed up. However, it was too late. Shannon was gone and so was Michael. After interviewing neighbors and other witnesses, police assumed that her driver Michael managed to calm her down and had taken her home, so that was it. Case closed. Two days later, on May 3rd, Shannon's boyfriend, Alex Diaz, just couldn't get in contact with Shannon and she never ended up coming home. Alex found Michael's phone number in one of Shannon's drawers and called him asking where she was. Michael said that this is when he realized that Shannon really never made it back home and was missing. Michael explained everything that had happened the night at Joseph's house and he even gave him Joseph's Joseph Brewer's number. That way, Alex could contact the client and get in touch with him to see if maybe he had seen Shannon. Well, instead of actually just calling Joseph, Alex actually gets in his car and just drives directly to Oak Beach and goes 
goes to Joseph Brewer's home to confront him and find Shannon. Upon arriving at Joseph's house, Joseph tells him that he had nothing to do with her disappearance and says that they can even go down to the police station together to report her as missing. At this point, it's late, it's past midnight, but Alex is like, yeah, let's do this. Like, this is really weird. I need to find my girlfriend. Unfortunately, when they get to the police station, they were told that they would have to report her as missing in Jersey City, which is where she lived and that the police in Oak Beach could not help them. So Alex goes back to Jersey City and he calls Shannon's family and they officially report her as missing on May 4th. Now, this is where things just get even weirder and where you can really just dive into a whole bunch of different like speculations and theories and you know, there's just some conflicting reports, but based on the court documents, I was able to gather the following. So on May 3rd, which was two days days after the incident, Shannon's mother, Mary, received a strange and very unexpected call from someone named Charles Peter Hackett, also known as Dr. Hackett. Now, he was a former head of the Suffolk County Emergency Medical Services who lived in Oak Beach in that same gated community where Shannon was last seen. So, Dr. Hackett calls Mary and and tells her that he ran a halfway house for women who wanted to get off the streets and that he had actually seen Shannon the night of May first which again is a night that she disappeared. Now, the reason for this call was because he says that he was worried about her after she left unexpectedly. And he said that he saw Shannon acting irrational, so he gave her a narcotic to calm her down. Then again, three days later on May 6th, Dr. Hackett makes another phone call to Shannon's family. When the family asks how he even got their information, like their phone number and names, etc., he says that he got their number because it's a rule in the halfway house for each person to give them an emergency contact number. Now, Shannon's mom just listens to this and is like, huh? Like, this is so weird. Like, my daughter would never stay at a wayward home. She would never be doing any of this. And she just got a really bad gut feeling. Now, Mary received these phone calls before she even knew that her daughter was missing. Because again, her and Alex reported Shannon as missing on May 4th, but Dr. Hackett had called her on May 3rd. So after Mary and Alex report Shannon as missing, they tell the police this information, you know, about Dr. Hackett's phone call. Dr. Hackett was questioned by police about these phone calls around a year later, which is crazy that it took an entire year for him to be questioned, but he denied ever seeing Shannon. He did admit to the phone calls because, you know, phone records don't lie and they literally show that he called Mary. He even called Shannon's sister, Cherie, from his personal and home phone on those two occasions, which were May 3rd and May 6th. But like I said, he denied ever running away wayward home. He denied giving Shannon a narcotic and he even denied seeing her the night that she disappeared. So all of this is just very fishy because why would he call Shannon's mom to tell her all of this information if it was just a lie? Like literally, what's the point of calling the mom and saying, hey, I run this home. Shannon was here. She was acting irrational. I gave her this narcotic. Like this is what happened. Like what's the point of saying that when that's a lie? It's just so freaking weird. Dr. Hackett said that yes, he sometimes did help neighbors with simple first aid assistance or like medical advice, but that the night that Shannon went missing, he was sleeping in his bed with his wife and he was adamant on that. The reason that he said that is because a lot of people started to speculate that maybe Shannon ran to his house in the middle of the night and asked him for help, but again, he denies ever seeing her. So again, this is just all very weird and Shannon's mom had it very clear what he told her and there were other testimonies of neighbors who also had heard some suspicious things Dr. Hackett said as well. One neighbor says that he was driving past the Hackett residence and allegedly overheard Dr. Hackett pacing by his house and telling his wife that, quote, he couldn't believe the situation he had put his family in and that his intention was to, quote, help Shannon not kill her. So those were some pretty intense testimonies and Dr. Hackett's alleged and possible involvement in Shannon's disappearance was polarizing. Chief of detectives in Suffolk County, Dominic Verone, said that Hackett was not a suspect in Shannon's disappearance and that the calls he made were not out of character. According to Dominic, Dr. Hackett, quote, is an individual who likes to get involved. Some call him a storyteller and an exaggerator. We certainly believe that he may have called to offer his assistance. Other neighbors also spoke out and said that it was not a surprise hearing how Dr. Hackett pretty much inserted himself into the investigation, that that's literally what he was like. You know, that he was allegedly always getting involved in other people 
people's business and just kind of making up stories. So people thought that it was very well possible that maybe he did get involved too far this time and that he accidentally killed Shannon with the narcotics that he allegedly gave her. But again, those are just people's opinions, not facts. Other people believe that maybe when Shannon and Joseph left the house, that they actually went to Dr. Hackett's house to get some type of pills or whatever it was that Dr. Hackett had on hand. And that's when he could have possibly seen Shannon that night. Again, none of this has ever been confirmed, but it is just something to think about. I mean, I don't get why this guy would lie. Even though people say that he is like a storyteller and that he's like just like a cheese muscle in the neighborhood, I still think that this is just such an inappropriate thing to lie about. And it's so weird how he just wanted to insert himself into this investigation. According to Dr. Hackett, in a letter that he wrote to 48 Hours CBS News, which I will include here and in the description box down below, he says that he was in contact with Shannon's boyfriend, Alex Diaz, and her driver, Michael Pack, on May 6th because the two of them had actually gone to Oak Beach together to look for Shannon and they just ended up running into Dr. Hackett. Dr. Hackett says that he gave them his contact information in case he could help in any way since he was a board member with the Oak Beach HOA and could really be helpful and, you know, so on, so on. He even tells Alex and Michael that they can leave to not worry about Shannon and that he would make sure that the police started investigating right away. He told them that he would actually call the police and ask them to come look for Shannon, but turns out that he never did. Before Michael and Alex left Oak Beach, Dr. Hackett asked them for Shannon's family's contact information and they gave it to him. Then on May 9th, he called Shannon's sister. Now, the strange thing is that Michael and Alex didn't meet up with Dr. Hackett until May 6th, which is when he claims that he got the family's contact info from, you know, directly from Alex and Michael. But Dr. Hackett called Shannon's mom on May 3rd according to his phone records. Like there's literally proof that he did this. So how is he saying, oh, I didn't get her contact information until May 6th, but yeah, he called the mom on May 3rd. I don't know, a lot of people just wonder like, what is going on here? Like, why did he have to insert himself into the case? It's just all very strange. But in the end, Dr. Hackett was cleared with having any involvement in her disappearance. Police also did end up clearing the driver, Michael. They ended up clearing the client, Joseph, and they also ended up clearing her boyfriend, Al. Alex. After clearing all of these people, police still had a job to do. They still needed to find Shannon. So the search for Shannon continued and no one knew what could have happened to her or where she was. What's shocking is that the residents in the neighborhood in Oak Beach where Shannon went missing state that they did not see the police show up until three months after she went missing. Yeah, it took the police three months to start looking for a missing woman. Gus, the neighbor that I mentioned earlier, was so surprised to see the police show up months later because he felt, you know, What's the point? It's too late now to look for her. The searches for Shannon were not easy. The surrounding areas where Shannon was last seen were mainly beaches, but not like typical beaches. They were mainly marshes and sandy dunes, so it wasn't the easiest to conduct searches. There were these thick bushes that had ticks and thorns, and it was just very hard to move around it. On December 11th, 2010, a police officer named John Malia and his canine named Blue were searching for Shannon at Gilgo Beach, which is right where Shannon was last seen. Gilgo Beach and Oak Beach are often referred to as one since they're basically the same beach. John and Blue are searching the beach for Shannon when Blue suddenly comes across something. In this something were skeletal remains stuffed in a camouflage burlap sack. According to retired chief of detectives Dominic Verone, the guy that I mentioned earlier, everyone assumed that these remains that Blue had found belonged to Shannon. However, to everyone's surprise, this wasn't her. The remains actually belonged to 24-year-old Melissa Bartholomew, who disappeared the year prior to Shannon in July of 2009. So this search for Shannon led to the discovery of Melissa's remains and uncovered a gruesome burial ground. Two days later, three more bodies were found. They were Amber Costello, who went missing in September of 2010, Megan Waterman, who went missing in June of 2010, and Maureen Brainyard Barnes, who went missing in 2007. They all had a lot of similarities. You know, they were all found very close to each other, bound at the ankles or feet, and they were all wrapped in camouflage burlap sacks. All four women appeared to have been strangled, 
All four of them were escorts, just like Shannon, posting their services on Craigslist. All four women were contacted by a burner phone before their deaths. All four were petite, white, in their 20s, and had green or hazel eyes. These four women found on this beach became known as the Gilgo Four. Unfortunately, Shannon had still not appeared. The search for her was still ongoing, which we will get into a little bit later. All of this happened because of Shannon's disappearance. You know, a lot of people wonder if Shannon hadn't gone missing, would the bodies of these four women ever have been found? The Suffolk County Police Commissioner Richard Dormer said that they were possibly dealing with a serial killer. Four bodies were found in the same circumstances, very close to each other. I mean, it just couldn't be a coincidence. They were definitely dealing with something bigger. Let's talk about what happened to the Gilgo Four. We'll start with Maureen Brainyard Barnes. Maureen was a 25-year-old mother of two, a girl and a boy, and she also had a younger sister named Missy and a younger brother named Will. She previously worked as a blackjack dealer, grocery clerk, and telemarketer, but turned to escorting to further make ends meet as she was raising her two kids on her own. According to her sister Missy, Maureen was actually getting evicted from her home and was fighting a custody battle in court for one of her children, so she was under a lot of pressure to come up with the money. She lived in Norway, Connecticut, but traveled to New York on the weekends by train to work. So, according to an interview that Missy did with the List podcast host Chris Mass, which I will link in the description box down below, on Sunday, July 8th, 2007, Maureen called her sister Missy at around 11:30 p.m. from Penn Station in Midtown Manhattan. Missy had somewhat of a hard time hearing her clearly because of all of the noise from Penn Station, but she remembered that Maureen had asked her if she could get a ride from her boyfriend Chris because she had been robbed and someone stole pretty much all of her money. Now Missy didn't drive so she couldn't go pick up her sister and she said that her boyfriend Chris was already sleeping so she told her sister Maureen to just call their brother Will and ask if he could go pick her up. However, Will also couldn't go pick her up either because he actually had to work. So Maureen called Missy back and told her that she would ask around from a few other friends for a ride, but that if no one could give her a ride, then she would just take the train back home. So that was that. Missy says that that was the last time that she ever heard from her sister Maureen. She says it was as if she had just went poof and disappeared. The next day, Maureen wasn't answering anybody's phone calls and no one had heard from her, which was very unusual behavior from her. Missy and her brother Will were just getting a very bad gut feeling, so Missy said that she was able to get into Maureen's email to see if she could find any information that could help them figure out where she was. Well, it turns out that Maureen never told her family that she began escorting. Missy only found out what she was doing in New York from her emails since she was posting ads on Craigslist and other websites. She believed that her sister was going to New York to do modeling and photo shoots and things like that. So when her and her brother found out about this, they were just completely shocked. I mean, now they were really scared that something bad could have happened to her sister. Missy did report her as missing, but there was just no clues of her whereabouts. That same week, Missy's husband and Will went to Manhattan to post Maureen's photos up and just like post flyers and spread awareness and ask people if they had seen her, but no one knew anything. The only thing they knew was that Maureen had checked out of a hotel in Manhattan and was never seen again. Unfortunately, the cameras at the hotel did not work, so there was no surveillance footage of her last moments. Years would pass without any news of her whereabouts. Missy and her brother throughout those years continued searching for her and using her email account to look for clues as to where she could have gone to, but there was just nothing. That was until 2010, when Maureen had been confirmed to be one of the Gilgo Four. It was just devastating to hear the news. Missy says that her sister had a huge heart and that if you, quote, ask for the last penny in her pocket, she would give it to you, end quote. She loved being a mom. She was smart, creative, spontaneous, and fun. And Missy wants people to know that her sister was more than what the media has described her as, which is as, quote, just an escort. She said that losing Maureen is a wound that has never truly healed. Maureen was inspired to become a writer someday, and she just loved reading books. She used to read stories to Missy and comfort her when she was scared during a thunderstorm, or if they had read like a scary story when they were younger. They would have dinner at each other's house and just 
spend time together as they got older. One of Maureen's daughters spoke and said, quote, I was only seven years old when my mother was murdered. Her loss drastically changed the trajectory of my life. There are countless times that I needed her and she was not there. I remember she read to me every night and now I can no longer remember the sound of her voice. I wish she was here today, but she was taken from us, end quote. Unfortunately, her family and children will never know what Maureen could have gone on to accomplish in life because her life was taken from her. Her children have had to grow up without their mother and Maureen never got the chance to be by her children's side while they grew up. Missy has been such an amazing advocate for her sister and she does her best to keep her essence alive and she has given talks at schools about the dangers of online escorting to young women to spread awareness and I think that's a very admirable thing to do. The second woman we'll be talking about in the Gilgo Four is Melissa Mary Bartholomew. 24-year-old Melissa grew up in a very hardworking family in Buffalo, New York, and spent a lot of time with her mom, Lynn, her grandparents, and her younger sister, Amanda, whom she was very close to. They would spend a lot of time watching movies together, and Melissa would help Amanda get ready in the morning for school. She taught her younger sister how to tie her shoes and how to ride a bike. She was honestly just such a good big sister. Honestly, the entire family was super close. Melissa was actually born in the same hospital her mom Lynn was born in and the doctor that delivered Lynn also delivered Melissa, which is just crazy. Like, how does that even happen? Growing up, Melissa was very independent and smart. She had very good grades. She was very good at math and she wanted to become a lawyer. She was also really tough. I believe she was 4'9 and 95 pounds, but she was very tough and knew how to defend herself. So her dream was to become a lawyer. However, when she started to get a little bit older, when she was around 16, she became really interested in doing hair. She had found a new passion and said that this was going to be her dream. So she went to cosmetology school and after graduating from cosmetology school in her hometown of Buffalo, New York, she began working at Supercuts. Melissa, however, wanted something bigger. She wanted to open up her own hair salon one day and to have her own business. She ended up moving to the Bronx, New York to follow those dreams. Melissa's mother, Lynn, was so scared for her baby to move to the big city of New York and just be all on her own. But Melissa was of age, so the only thing Lynn could do was to tell her daughter to be careful. One of her friends named Marcus actually helped her move to New York. Their friendship had turned romantic and he said that he had some type of connection in New York and could help Melissa move there and open up her own hair salon. While she raised the money to open her own salon, Marcus introduced Melissa to a man named Johnny who owned a hair salon and he offered her a job to work at the salon. On. With this new job, Melissa made the move and after moving to New York, Melissa actually ended up breaking up with Marcus and she actually started to date Johnny the salon owner. Now looking back at this, Lynn honestly feels that Marcus basically sold her daughter Melissa to Johnny under the ruse that he was a salon owner and that he could help Melissa open up her own salon one day. The reason Lynn feels this way is because somewhere along the way after moving to New York, Melissa began escorting as a way to make ends meet. On July 8th, 2009, Lynn contacted the NYPD to file a missing persons report after days of not hearing from Melissa. Lynn was really worried. You know, the only thing the family knew was that Melissa was last seen outside of her apartment on July 12th, 2009 in the Bronx after telling a friend that she was going to meet with a client. That's it. Nothing else. In the weeks following Melissa's disappearance, Melissa's 15-year-old sister, Amanda, began receiving taunting calls from someone using Melissa's phone. When Amanda first saw that her sister was calling her, she was so excited. She was like, oh my God, thank God, Melissa's okay, everything's fine, and like, we're okay. However, that excitement faded as soon as Amanda picked up the phone because the person on the other line was not her sister, Melissa. It was an unknown man. According to the family's attorney, Stephen, the person making the calls was, quote, soft-spoken and had a very controlled and comfortable manner of speech, which made his horrific messages all the more devastating. He began to toy with Amanda. And for the very first time, she heard the voice of the killer. This man would tell Amanda very vulgar and just sexually explicit things that he had done to her sister, Melissa. They even threatened Amanda, saying that he knew where she lived and that he would do the same things to her. He would tell her that she would never see her sister, Melissa, again because he had killed her and share details that someone who either knew the killer or was the killer would know. He also gave very specific details about Melissa's tattoos, about her appearance, you know, things 
things like that. Of course, Amanda reported this to the police. I mean, she was so freaking scared about this. I mean, the guy was literally saying that he was watching her and that he would do the same things to her. So she was super, super scared and she reported this to the police. After the third call, authorities did try to track down where the calls were coming from and they discovered that they were made from a burner phone out of Midtown Manhattan in very busy areas such as Times Square and the Empire State Building, which made it very hard and pretty much impossible to pinpoint exactly who was making these calls. I mean, as you know, burner phones are prepaid for and they have no tie to any personal information. So it was just really, really hard to like track down the caller. After these phone calls, time went by and there was still no word of Melissa's whereabouts or of who the man on the phone was. I mean, everyone was wondering what happened to Melissa? Where was she? And why is this guy taunting Amanda? Unfortunately, Lynn recalls the moment that she knew her daughter was not going to come home. Her and her fiance were sitting down watching CNN when the news of the bodies found came up. Her and her fiance looked at each other and they just knew. Lynn says that she thinks of Melissa every single minute of the day and that her death destroyed her family. Melissa was so ambitious and she just wanted to make a better life for her. She was kind-hearted and had a family who loved her so much and Melissa loved her family just as much. 10 months after her disappearance, the family had actually hired a psychic. This psychic told the family that Melissa was buried in a shallow grave near a body of water with a sign nearby containing the letter G. Now, this has kind of split people's opinion. You know, some people believe the psychic just told the family anything that came to their mind. And since New York is obviously surrounded by water and, you know, just told them the letter G since, since it's a very common letter in words like highway. Also, because Melissa was not buried in a shallow grave, she was actually found above ground in a burlap sack. Other people say that the psychic nailed it. And although she wasn't 100% accurate by giving the exact street names or more details, she was pretty spot on. So I don't know. I feel like you guys already know my opinion with psychics, but what do you guys think? The third woman in the Gilgal Four is 22-year-old Megan Amelia Waterman. Megan was a mother to a three-year-old daughter, and she was actually the youngest of the Gilgal Four. She was from Scarborough, Maine, and she grew up in quite a rough home and neighborhood and kind of had to raise herself. She had an older brother named Greg, who she absolutely loved, and they got along really well. They would watch Full House together and play games and just spend time with one another. Megan actually became pregnant at 17 years old old and she really wanted to provide a good life for her baby, you know, a much better home than the one that she had grew up in. However, she was struggling to make ends meet after becoming a mom. She was working at a sandwich shop, but she needed more money. So she eventually turned to escorting after a friend of hers told her that she could make good money with it. Later on, however, Megan was introduced by the same friend to a man named Akeem. Now, Akeem swept Megan off her feet and started kind of like love bombing Megan and then eventually convinced her into letting him manage her sex work. However, the lovey-dovey man Megan thought that she met was the opposite. He then began abusing her and would take her to New York where the money was better. Her family begged her to stop escorting and to leave the boyfriend before things got more dangerous. She had already been arrested for prostitution once and her family just didn't want anything worse to happen. Unfortunately, Megan was last seen on surveillance footage at a Holiday Inn Express in Hapaug, New York on June 6, 2010 at around 1.30 in the morning when she was on her way to meet with a client. However, that is the last time that she was seen. After days of Megan not checking in with her daughter, Megan's family reported her as missing as they thought it was very unusual behavior from her. Her family put out flyers in the community asking for help and they looked for Megan everywhere, but there was no sign of her. In an interview with 48 Hours, Megan's daughter says that she would do anything to bring her mom back, but that she can't and it just frustrates her so badly. She said that if she could see her mom today, she would tell her that she loves her and that she has a special place for her in her heart, a spot no one could ever replace. They would read stories together, watch movies, play games, and just snuggle up together. The family says life without her is hell, and they just hope that she receives justice. Megan's half-sister, Allie, said that Megan was deserving of a life free from violence and pain, and that she just had such a beautiful heart. As for what happened to her boyfriend slash pimp, he was actually arrested on April 11th, 2012 on charges of interstate trafficking of prostitutes and he was sentenced to three years in federal prison in January of 2013. The fourth woman in the Gilgo Four is 27-year-old Amber Lynn Overstreet Costello. So, 
who was Amber. Amber was living in West Babylon, Long Island, and began working as an escort to make ends meet and to also help pay for her drug addiction. She did go to rehab and she tried to turn things around and, you know, fight her addiction once and for all. However, she relapsed shortly before her disappearance. She lived with two roommates and one of her roommates, who goes by the nickname Bear, says that Amber was just a remarkable person. He says that she had to do whatever she did to feed the monsters she had in her, but that she was a good person, a giver, an unbelievably loyal and genuine person with a huge heart. He says there's nothing she wouldn't do for those she loved. She was more than what the media says about her. You know, she was someone's daughter. She was a sister, a caregiver, a friend, and a human. Just because somebody chooses to do something to make money doesn't make them less of a human. She wasn't a sex worker. She was a human being. You know, she's somebody's daughter, she's somebody's sister, and she was my friend. She was a really, really sweet girl. I feel that as a friend, I should have just drawn a hard line and prevented this whole thing. It was a horribly dysfunctional family. <laughs> Well, it was family nonetheless. Amber didn't want to escort, but, you know, addiction makes you do things that you normally wouldn't do. Her roommates did try talking her out of it because of how dangerous it is, but unfortunately, she did it anyway. When Amber began taking on clients, she and her roommates had a rule that she would mostly meet with the clients in the house. That way, her roommates would be there and they could step in if anything went wrong or if something happened. They also had a pit bull, so Amber was, in a way, very protected in her her house. She also did out calls, but very few. And if she did, it was at hotels, never at anyone's house. And her roommate Bear and her other roommate Dave would take her and then pick her up. But anytime Amber would do an out call, me or Dave would always drive her to the hotel. It would never be somebody's house. If you go to somebody's house, they control the situation completely. One day, Amber was with a client in the living room and Bear and her other roommate, Dave, were in the bedroom waiting for her to finish so that they could go about their day and, you know, come out of the room. It was taking a little longer than usual and Bear was like, you know, I have an idea on how we can get rid of this guy. So he stripped naked and then he walked out of the bedroom and pretended not to see Amber and her client on the couch as he grabbed a drink from the refrigerator. And then when he turned his head and saw Amber and her client on the couch, he told the guy, hey, what are you doing with my wife? And the guy just immediately got up and then darted out of the house thinking that this was her husband. Amber just started laughing on the couch like, what on earth are you doing, Bear? And they were just laughing and thought that this was really funny. From that point on, they thought that they could do this, you know, little act more often as a way for Amber to not actually have to have sex and as a way to keep her safe. So the plan was for Amber to lure in a client and after the client would pay and before before they began anything sexual, one of Amber's male roommates would barge in and act like they were her boyfriend and then force the client to leave, leaving Amber with the money and without ever actually having to with the guy. It was a scam that they did plenty of times, but never with Amber's, you know, regular clients. However, on one particular night, the scam seemed to go south. On September 1st, 2010, Amber was doing the usual ruse, but according to Bear, he said that this, quote, Frankenstein big looking dude was angry and wanted his money back. Bear and Amber's other roommate Dave began arguing with him. Things almost escalated to you know like a bad point when Dave threatened to hit this man with a bat if he didn't leave and Bear had to hold back their pit bull dog and you know, this kind of intimidated this guy to leave the house. Amber got scared and she actually ran to hide because they were all arguing and her roommates were shouting at this guy so it was just a very chaotic situation. The big guy eventually leaves and Bear says that he remembers walking out the front door to see the guy leave while he was still holding on to his pit bull by the collar and he says that he saw the guy get into a dark colored first generation Chevy Avalanche and then leave. Shortly after Amber got a text from the man saying quote that wasn't nice and he asked for a credit on his next encounter with her which he wanted out of her house where there wouldn't be any boyfriend or roommates or pit bulls or anything to intervene. On September 2nd, 20 
2010, Amber disappeared. According to an interview from 48 Hours with Dave, he says that he remembers a client kept calling her and was just absolutely relentless. He was offering Amber $1,500 and Amber felt like this was really good money. So with that, she decided to accept the client's offer and he got her to go do something that she never did, which was to leave her house without her purse or her cell phone. Bear says that sometimes Amber did do car calls, which was when her clients would park in front of the house or like around the corner. And then Amber would just like quickly run out. She would do what she had to do in the car. And that sometimes she wouldn't always take her phone, but she would take her purse. So he thinks that maybe that's what happened that night. Maybe this client just wanted a car call for $1,500. So Amber was like, okay, great. And that's why she left the house without her purse or her phone. Amber said goodbye to Dave, gave him a hug and told him that she loved him. She said the client was down the block. So she started making her way to the car and Dave is like, hello, you forgot your purse and your cell phone. Like, why are you leaving without those items? And that Amber was kind of just like, no, it's fine. Like, I don't really need it. But Dave was just very confused again because he's like, this is something that she never does. Like, she would always take her purse with her. So he kind of got a weird feeling and he decided to watch Amber go to the client's car just to make sure that everything was okay. And he says that he remembers that the client kind of looked like an ogre in the sense that he was really huge. And he also memorized the model of his truck, which was a dark colored first generation Chevy Avalanche. Unfortunately, that would be the last time that he would ever see Amber alive. Amber left the phone at the house. That makes no sense. Why? Amber would would not go to the bathroom without that phone. What was the number that was calling? So they were saying there was a friend in her phone? If Dave said Amber left the phone at the house, then I guess Amber left the phone at the house. Dave did, never told me that she left her phone behind. I would have, I would have lost my my mind right then. Like, what are you thinking? You gonna let Amber go into this man's car without you there now without communication? The next morning, no one was able to get in contact with Amber, and this is when her friends and roommates knew that they had to report her as missing. Amber's sister Kimberly told Baron Dave that she had filed a missing persons report, but. That wasn't true. And it wasn't until later when the roommates realized that she never even reported her own sister as missing. Dave said that Amber was an amazing person and her friends say despite the struggles that she was facing, she was so incredibly kind and she had a good heart, but that at one point just happened to take the wrong path. Amber was Bear's dear friend and he is always doing interviews and just, you know, making posts about her and spreading awareness about her story and just keeping her name alive. Her, Dave and Bear would go to the movies. They would hang out as friends. They were more than just roommates. I mean, they were literally best friends. Bear has done multiple interviews, which I recommend you guys watch. They're on YouTube on Winter's Brothers Stories channel, which I will link down below. I watched all of them and Bear has a lot to say and you can get to know Amber more from someone who personally knew her and just hear more stories about her life. That YouTube channel also has more videos about Lisk and about the other victims, so I highly recommend watching the channel to just hear more about this. His channel also had an interview with one of Amber's childhood friends named Melissa, and it was just very nice to hear how Amber was growing up and just more about who she was as a person. Because again, a lot of people just like to focus on the fact that she was an escort and that she had an addiction and you know things like that. Bear says that the media has just spread a lot of information about Amber and about them as well. Kind of just making it seem like the roommates were all like junkies living in a drug crazed house and that he and Dave were Amber's pimps and even that Amber was funding all of their addiction. But he says that that's absolutely not the case and was just nothing like that. He says that they were all friends, that there was nothing romantic going on between any of them, and that they all did their best to, you know, somewhat live a normal life. They were young and they were troubled, but nothing like what the media has portrayed them to be. Bear said that Amber was very tiny, very petite, very affectionate, and that she loved to cuddle up next to you and was just an extremely loyal to those she loved. She had a Southern accent that Bear loved hearing because he was from the South too and just made him remember his hometown. He said that she wore Daisy Dukes and wore simple clothes like t-shirts and just comfortable clothing. So that's just a little bit more about who Amber was and what happened before she went missing and was murdered. So 
Going back to the case, all of this was very big news. I mean, these four women were found where no one expected this kind of thing to happen. No one expected a serial killer to be on the loose in this town where this stuff was just unheard of. It was just truly horrific to everybody in the community. What shocked everyone even more was that not too long after the Gilgo Four were discovered, another body was discovered. Then another, and another, and another, and another. Authorities just couldn't believe it. It was crazy and it was something that they had never experienced before. The thing is, where these bodies were found and the condition they were found in were different from the Gilgo Four. The Gilgo Four were all found near each other. Their bodies were found in similar constraints, each in camel burlap, each had signs of strangulation, and were all young women. These new bodies were different. They were each found in very different areas. Their conditions they were found in were very different. Their age was different, their gender, and their race. It took a lot of time, you know, Know, testing and questioning to kind of piece together the remains police found because of how scattered all of the discoveries were. So who were they? The fifth body found was 20 year old Jessica Taylor, who was working as an escort in New York City. Her dismembered and naked torso was found back in 2003 in Manorville, which is a nearby city. However, her hands, head and her forearm were not found until March 29th, 2011. She had a tattoo that was attempted to be destroyed by her killer with various cuts. The tattoo was a heart with wings that read Remy's Angel, which was a nickname for her boyfriend slash pimp. She was last seen in the streets of Manhattan near the Port Authority bus terminals. She was originally from Poughkeepsie, New York, but ended up leaving home when she was a teenager and moved to Brooklyn, New York. Her family says that she was fierce and always stood up for herself and that she just had an absolutely beautiful and captivating smile. The sixth body was a 24-year-old mother of one child, Valerie Mack, who was an escort from Philadelphia. Like Jessica Taylor, her tour was found in September of 2000 in Manorville as well. Her right foot, hands, and her head were not found until April 4th, 2011, near Jessica Taylor's partial remains. So again, very similar. She was able to be identified by DNA after authorities tracked down her son, whose DNA was in the system since he had been incarcerated. She had a very short life, and it was a very rough life. She became an orphan at a young age, and she was in foster homes and was later adopted by an elderly couple who passed away. She became pregnant in high school and began escorting to make ends meet. She was last seen in Port Republic, New Jersey in the spring of 2000. There really isn't much information about her personal life, but that's what I was able to find. I hope more information about who she was does come out so people can get to know her. The seventh body found was actually a male. Unfortunately, this male remains a John Doe to this day. He has not been able to be identified, but he is an Asian male estimated to be between 17 and 23 years old. He was found on April 4th, 2011, wearing woman's clothing. He had missing teeth and he also had very severe trauma to his head. Police did release a sketch of him, but nothing has come from it yet. Investigators believe that whoever did this to him was possibly duped by the man posing as a woman and had an outburst of anger, which led to his murder. The eighth body that was found was actually a small child, an African-American toddler who is believed to be two years old, wrapped in a blanket who had, you know, no dismemberment, injuries, or anything. The child was also found on April 4th, 2011, just 250 feet away from Valerie. Unfortunately, this baby was considered a baby doe for a long time, which we will come back to. This baby was wearing small gold hoop earrings and a necklace. The ninth body found ninth like that's insane that all these bodies were there for so long so the ninth body was 34 year old karen ann Vergata. karen's initial remains were found all the way back in 1996 her legs were found inside a plastic bag on fire island it wasn't until april 11th 2011 however that her head and teeth were discovered they were later linked by dna with the legs that were found karen's father says that she went missing on valentine's day in 1996 and 
and that he had hired a private investigator to look for her, but that it had resulted in nothing. He said in the time leading up to her disappearance, she had kind of grown distance from her family and that they began hearing less and less from her. She had two sons who were very young when they were placed into the foster care and that they were eventually adopted by a family. She ran into some tough times after high school and was arrested a few times and was just really struggling. She told the adoptive mother of her boys that she wanted the best for them and was happy that they ended up in a loving home. The tenth body found is unfortunately a Jane Doe. She has yet to be identified, but investigators believe that she is an African-American young woman between 20 and 30 years old, and they ended up giving her the nickname Peaches, since she has a tattoo of a partially bitten peach on her left breast. Similar to the other recent bodies, Peaches' torso was found in a bag inside a green plastic container, along with a red towel and floral pillowcase back in 1997 in Hempstead Lake. She was identified after additional remains of hers were found and linked back to her torso. Additionally, investigators discovered that Peaches is actually the mother of the baby doe, the toddler that I mentioned earlier, and they discovered this through DNA. Peaches was also wearing a similar type of jewelry her child had on. Now, there were two leads that could have identified Peaches. Her tattoo was actually published in a couple of tattoo magazines in hopes that someone would either recognize the tattoo because they knew Peaches or that the tattoo artist would recognize their own work. A man named Stephen Collins says that he recognized a tattoo while flipping through a tattoo magazine. He remembers giving that tattoo to a young girl who came into his shop with a female friend before he closed. Unfortunately, nothing really came from this as either he didn't have her name written down and he didn't remember her name. It's so strange, you know, because if this was Peaches who he did tattoo, then the friend that she went with hasn't come forward yet about Peaches' disappearance, which is really weird. The tattoo artist Steven says that in 2012, much after Peaches went missing, he got a call from someone claiming to be Peaches' mother who said that her grandson wanted a memorial tattoo of her. Again, nothing came from this and no one ever ended up showing up, nor did they ever leave any contact information. Another lead that unfortunately has led to nothing as of now is a man named Elijah Howard. He has passed away, but investigators are trying to get in contact with his relatives or his friends in hopes that they can identify Peaches and her daughter. I wasn't able to find, you know, exactly why Elijah might be connected to Peaches. Maybe he's a relative of hers or, you know, something like that, but we'll see where that goes. A lot of people wonder why, you know, the killer also killed Peaches' baby. It could just be that maybe the killer didn't want to leave any witnesses, you know, even though this was a baby who probably wouldn't remember much. It's just, it's really, really sad that this woman and her baby were killed and just left in this area as if they were nothing. So as of now, those were the additional bodies found near the Gilgo 4. Police couldn't figure out if they were now dealing with two serial killers. There's a lot of speculation if there was you know, one, two, or even multiple killers committing these murders. We're going full tilt with this investigation and we want people to know that there's a killer out there or killers. We want to bring that person or persons in. People were scared. Now, even though all these bodies were found, none of them belonged to Shannon Gilbert. Shannon was still missing. No one had heard from her. No one had seen her. Nothing. Shannon's mom was very vocal about the police working harder to find her daughter. I mean, it seemed impossible that Shannon was last seen in the same area as where all these bodies were found, yet she still had not been found yet. Yeah, every time they discover a new body. I always feel like it could be my sister's and I feel like, you know, you live like this double life when something like this happens because when you, especially when you have children, you have to be happy for them, you have to raise them, you have to kind of forget about it, but then you go to bed at night and it's always on your mind. It's not ever going to go away until you find out where she is, whether, you know, she's gone or she's safe. However, on December 7th, 2011, there was finally a discovery. Shannon's purse, cell phone, jeans, and her shoes were found. And then, unfortunately, just a few days later, on December 13th, 2011, Shannon was found in a marsh at Gilgo Beach. According to investigators, Shannon drowned in the marsh, and her death was ultimately an accident and unrelated to the other victim. The marsh she was found in was very difficult to move in, and they believe that she mistakenly stepped into it and was unable to escape 
escape the quicksand effect of the marsh and drowned or either died from hypothermia. The coroner, however, was unable to determine a cause of death and her toxicology report stated that she had no drugs in her system. When Shannon's family heard the news, they were not buying it. You know, they heard the 911 call Shannon made. She sounded afraid and she was absolutely running away from something or someone and they didn't believe that she had simply drowned but yet was somehow found without her clothes on. So because of their doubts, they ended up commissioning a private autopsy and this private autopsy revealed that Shannon had a broken bone in her neck that is consistent with strangulation and that she was found face up, which is unlikely for someone who has drowned. Shannon's mom was just in disbelief that there was no connection. I mean, she literally disappeared in the same area. She was working as an escort like the other girls. She was found naked like the other girls and appeared to have been strangled just like the others. However, police said that there was no connection and that her death was non-criminal. Police Commissioner Rodney Harrison said, quote, Shannon was a loving daughter, sister, and a young woman who should have had her whole life ahead of her. Based on the evidence of the facts and the totality of the circumstances, the prevailing opinion of Shannon's death, while tragic, was not murder and most likely not criminal. According to one of Shannon's foster parents named Jennifer, she came out and said that Shannon was diagnosed with bipolar disorder when she was 12 years old and was on medication, but that she had stopped taking them in high school because it gave her the shape. So with that statement, people have speculated that maybe Shannon was having an emotional episode and that's why it sounded like she was on drugs during her 911 call. Despite her toxicology report, again, showing no drugs in her system. It's honestly a tragedy that we just may never know exactly what happened that night, but authorities have ruled out her driver, Michael Pack. They have ruled out her client, Joseph, and they have also ruled out Dr. Hackett from having any involvement in her death. So if she wasn't a victim like the other four that were found by the same person, then who did this to her? It doesn't matter if people think that she's a victim of the Long Island serial killer or not something happened to her that night she ran for her life she was in fear it's honestly just very strange and i really hope that there is some new information about her death and that this does come to light and that she does receive justice now mary shannon's mother wasn't going to just forget all about what dr hackett had done because again he made up a whole story about how shannon was living in his wayward home how he had given her a narcotic how blah 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 like he basically just inserted himself into the investigation but then later told police that he lied about it so of course Shannon's mother was not going to just let him get away with this. The Gilbert family's lawyer actually filed a wrongful death lawsuit against Dr. Peter Hackett and I'm going to leave you guys a little snippet of what the lawsuit stated because it, there's just so much information in that like I was trying to read through it and it was just super super long so they did end up filing a lawsuit but unfortunately due to the statute of limitations the lawsuit was dismissed. What makes this just even more heartbreaking and just so freaking unfair like I swear what I'm about to say right now is going to shock you but unfortunately Shannon's mom Mary who worked so hard to get police to look for her daughter will never be able to hear what truly happened to her because unfortunately in 2016 Mary was actually murdered and how she was killed is just absolutely horrible on July 23rd 2016 Mary's daughter Sarah Gilbert asked her mom to come over to her house because she was quote hearing voices now, Mary knew that since Shannon's death, Sarah had been struggling, so of course she went to go help her and just be there for her daughter. Upon arriving, however, Mary was stabbed by Sarah with a 15 inch knife over 227 times and then was bludgeoned with a fire extinguisher. Sarah also sprayed extinguisher foam in Mary's mouth. When police arrived, Sarah was smoking a cigarette and whispered to police that she killed her mom because the voices in her head told her her mom was a devil and a bad god. After she was placed in handcuffs, she asked the officer, she's alive, right? Is this a joke? My mom is not dead. My mom is not dead. So it's just yet another tragedy in addition to the family dealing with Shannon's death. Now her sisters have to deal with the death of their mom and the fact that one of their other sisters murdered her. It's just absolutely sad. It's so unfair and I just I can't believe that this happened. Cherie Gilbert, another one of Shannon's sisters, wrote on a Facebook post saying, quote, so as a lot of you may know, my mother passed away yesterday. She was murdered by my sister Sarah, who was battling a mental illness for two and a half years. 
My sister Stevie and I are incredibly devastated beyond words as our mother was the backbone of the family, end quote. Sarah was sentenced to 25 years to life in prison and during the trial, a forensic psychologist testified for Sarah's defense and said, quote, she suffered from acute symptoms of schizophrenia at the time of the killing, end quote. And she also mentioned that she had been previously diagnosed with schizophrenia and bipolar disorder. The prosecution replied to this by saying, I mean, we have have no doubt that the defendant suffers from a debilitating mental illness that blurs the lines between fiction and reality, and we are certainly sympathetic to that. However, the proof, however, reasonably supports the jury's finding that at the time of the killing, the defendant had the substantial capacity to know and appreciate both the nature and consequences of her conduct, and that such conduct was wrong. There's a lot more information about it in the court document, which I will have linked down below. It's really terrible that this family had to go through this. Robert Kolker, who wrote the book Lost Girls, an Unsolved American Mystery, which was later turned into the Netflix movie, said something that a lot of people really agree with. He said, quote, Mary understood that one way of finding at least a shred of meaning in the loss of her daughter was that her disappearance led to the discovery of those four women several months later and that without Shannon, there would be no case. There would be no search for the killer, which is 100% true like if her mom had not been pushing to search the area if she hadn't been doing the search parties and just really being vocal about her daughter's case like would this have even happened like would people even know that there was a serial killer in the area would this guy have continued to do this and just continue to harm more people Shannon just had such a full life ahead of her she finished high school at 16 years old and after graduating she worked different jobs such as a hostess at Applebee's a hotel receptionist and a snack prepper at a senior center. In 2007, she moved to New Jersey and began escorting. With this money, she was trying to complete some online college courses and she was also trying to make a career for herself as a singer and an actress going to auditions and things like that. My sister is saying from like the time that she was like five, six to you know up until the day she went missing, she loved singing. When she was younger, her idol was Mariah Carey, you know, and her voice was like like an R&B kind of voice. She really worked hard on it and, you know, that was something that she really wanted to do. She had hopes and dreams and they were cut short. She had a rough upbringing and she grew up in different foster homes after her mom left Shannon's father who was using heroin. She was smart and just very caring. Her boyfriend Alex admitted that they didn't have a perfect relationship. In fact, they were pretty toxic and that at one point he actually broke her jaw during an argument that happened years before her death, which resulted in her having a metal plate in her jaw. Very, very intense, um, but he says that he regrets regrets doing that and that that was years ago when they were like immature and fighting so I don't know the job that Shannon had of escorting was just a very dangerous line of work to be in and Mary said that she tried talking Shannon about moving back home with her and you know giving up this job but that Shannon would tell her not to worry and would say mom I hardly have to do anything and I get thousands of dollars referring to her job as escorting after Shannon's death Mary was photographed holding a photo of Shannon and said quote This is my daughter Shannon. She was not perfect. No one is perfect. She was loved. She was cared for. She does not deserve to be forgotten. There's a lot of theories about what happened to Shannon. You know, if Michael was involved, if Dr. Hackett was involved, even though they were all cleared. I mean, there is just so much speculation as to what could have happened to her. But unfortunately, until and if we know exactly what happened, I just hope that Shannon is resting peacefully and that her family stays strong and gets justice. So now let's go back to 2011 to the investigation following the discovery of the bodies at the Gilgo Beat. But before that, we need to discuss something. There was something that actually got in the way of the investigation, something that would stall investigations for years. This was a major corruption scandal with the Suffolk County Police. The former police chief, James Burke, was actually accused of botching the investigation by removing the FBI from the early stages of the investigation. I know, crazy. Like, why would you remove the FBI from trying to help you catch a serial killer? He also refused to share any discoveries with the FBI. Now, this was just an incredibly strange thing to do and his decision to do so was heavily criticized. It was later revealed that James let the case drop because the FBI was actually investigating him 
for a number of things. Yeah, like what the heck? I won't get into huge detail about it, but I'll just mention a few of the things that James was being looked at for. James actually assaulted a man for stealing a duffel bag from his department issued SUV that contained child corn, sex toys, among other things that he did not want to be exposed. He grew into a fit of rage and he actually began beating this man when he called him a pervert for what was in his bag. And then after beating him up and doing all these terrible things to him, he basically orchestrated a whole thing with his department to cover up the beating. Rob Trotta, who worked as a detective in the department for 25 years, said that James's behavior was really no secret to everyone. He recalls in the 1990s, James asked him if he knew where he could get his hands on a snuff film, which is a pornographic movie depicting a real murder. Why are you asking someone for that? Like that is actually insane. Then in 1995, James was disciplined for having sex with a prostitute in his patrol car. A sex worker came forward and said that she was with him at a cocaine fueled party in Oak Beach and that James paid her to have sex. She said, quote, we attempted to have sex together in the bathroom there, but he was unable to consummate the sex act. This made him extremely angry. He insisted upon oral sex, which was given. He then called me a whore. It was so aggressive that my eyes teared, not from crying. According to her, James forced her head down with a lot of force. She said that the whole thing was just dehumanizing and after he failed a second time to perform sexually, he threw $300 at her. She also recalls seeing him pulling a woman's hair at that party. Another sex worker came forward and said that James was very aggressive with her, grabbing her by the neck aggressively during one of their sexual encounters. And then several other sex workers also came forward sharing their stories of James' aggression during sexual encounters. He even strangled a stripper once and then also broke a sex worker's arm one. Which I'm just like, what the heck? Like if he had a history of doing all of this, why was he literally a police officer? That literally makes no sense. For Former colleagues of James said that he was always horny and that he just loved prostitutes and that he was a complete narcissist. The crazy thing again is that nobody did anything about this. Like having someone like James as chief of police, you guys, like I just can't believe these words are coming out of my mouth. It's just insane and it just made no sense, but he had people covering for him and his actions. So to everyone else not involved in this whole operation that James and a few others had going on, they just kind of accepted the idea that James let the ball fall on the case involving the murder of sex workers. They apparently meant nothing to him and he did a very poor half ass investigation into their murders. In 2016, James was arrested and he pled guilty to quote, a civil rights violation and conspiracy to obstruct justice and he was sentenced to 46 months in prison. Rob Trotta, the detective I mentioned earlier, said, said that Burke was just a sexual deviant and that these women were nothing to him, nothing. There was a quote, their only prostitutes attitude in the department at the time and that they thought of prostitutes as second-class citizens, which is just so sad. Like I mentioned at the beginning of the video, I feel like a lot of these cases went unsolved for so long because people had that attitude of like, well, they're sex workers. Like they did this to themselves. Why are they doing this dangerous work if they don't want to end up dead? It's a horrible mindset to have. So anyways, the chief of police, James, is just like a whole other thing and there's just so much information and there's other higher up people who were also arrested. So again, you can kind of just go into a rabbit hole with all of these people. They all just do not seem very nice. In fact, James was actually arrested again recently. Yeah, he was arrested in August of 2023 for public lewdness, indecent exposure, and criminal solicitation in a park. There isn't much of an update as of now for that, but I mean, this guy is just horrible. And the fact that he was in charge of the case of the Gilgo Four and of Shannon for so many years, but yet didn't care because again, they were just sex workers and he's a crazy guy that hates sex workers is so sad. Especially because again, he called off the FBI from continuing the investigation and he did his best to keep the FBI out of the loop which is just so, so harmful to the victims and to their families who are just looking for justice. So with James obviously focused on other matters back in 2011, the investigations in the Gilgo Beach killings were going cold. Things were moving very slow. The only lead that they really had was that of a man named John Biltroff. John was a carpenter from Manorville, New York, which if you recall, there were two torsos found in Manorville in the early 2000s, the ones of Jessica and the one 
ones of Valerie. It wasn't until 2011 that their torsos were linked to body parts found in Gilgo Beach. Now, the reason John became a suspect in 2017 was because he was convicted back in 2014 of murdering two women who were escorts and he also dumped their bodies in the 1990s. Jessica and Valerie's torsos were found just miles away from his home in the early 2000s. So because of that, he was actually named a suspect in the Gilgo Beach killing. But there was really no concrete evidence linking him to the Gilgo murders. So after clearing him, things just kind of went cold again. Speculation was still going forward about Joseph Brewer being the killer, about Dr. Peter Hackett and, you know, James Burke, but nothing concrete was ever confirmed. Over a decade went by without any answers. That was until January of 2022. This is when a newly appointed police chief named Rodney Harrison created a special Gilgo Beach Homicide Investigation Task Force composed of investigators, analysts, and prosecutors to work jointly with law enforcement partners from the Suffolk County Police Department, New York State Police, Suffolk County Sheriff's Office, and the FBI. This was great news. Everything was going to be revisited again and just looked at with fresh eyes. Just two months after creating this task force, there was a major lead. If you recall, Amber Costello's roommate said that he saw a dark colored Chevy Avalanche outside their home the night Amber Costello went missing. I mean, that's a pretty huge detail. And, you know, detectives had this lead under their noses for 13 years, but it took this new task force only two months to see its significance and track down whoever was driving or whoever owned the vehicle. Through vehicle records, investigators discovered that the truck belonged to 59-year-old Rex Andrew Hureman. Now, who is Rex? Well, Rex is a husband and father of two. I mean, what? Yeah, I remember hearing the news about Rex and I was just shocked. Like a father of two and a husband was now being looked at as the Gilgo Beach killer. All right, you guys, that is where we're gonna be stopping for today's part one video. I feel like this is gonna be super long. So like I said, there's just so much information to go over and there are so many moving parts to this case and just people involved. Thank you guys so much for being here and taking the time to listen to part one. There's a lot of information to go over in part two. So I will see you guys in the next video to talk about who Rex is and how he became a suspect in the Gilgo 4 killings. I would love to hear what you guys think about this so far. So definitely leave me a comment down below letting me know what you guys think about this. There's so many opinions to have. And again, all of my sources will be linked in the description box down below. If for some reason we, you know, put something incorrectly or we, we misspoke or, you know, things got confused, definitely let us know in the comments down below so we can correct anything. But yeah, I think that's pretty much all I have to say. I'm going to go chug all of this water right now because my throat is so incredibly dry and I will see you guys in the next video. Bye everyone.